developing now. The PM set to break an election promise with a tax cut backflip. Why it could be a boost for low to middle income earners as Labor grapples with the cost of living. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to another year of Media Watch and to another year of broken political promises, with the media lining up to mug the Prime Minister with claims that he's a true blue liar. And they had evidence aplenty. Nothing has changed. We're not reconsidering uh, that position. When you go to an election and you make commitments, you should stick to them. My word is my bond. Until it's not. And having shown that his word was worthless, the commentators fired their broadsides. The Prime Minister is a liar and a thief. This is a low act from a poor government. How does it feel to break a promise with the Australian people? Why should Australians trust that you won't lie to them again? Ouch. And the headlines in the News Corp papers were just as harsh, with their front pages slamming the PM as a deceitful, sneaky liability. And next day, the telly produced a dictionary to help decode the Prime Minister's spin. Lie. A change of position. Broken promise. A right decision. Betrayal. Good economic policy. These, it should be noted, are the same newspapers and TV hosts that have been bashing Labor for not doing more to tackle the cost of living. And as the PM pointed out, the broken promise will bring some relief to low- and middle-income workers who are struggling. The readers of the Daily Telegraph and the Herald Sun and the Courier Mail and the Advertiser overwhelmingly will be beneficiaries from what I'm announcing today. With this week's news poll showing, 62% support the tax changes and believe the PM did the right thing. Yet, it was Labor's breach of political faith that the media wanted to run hard on. Despite independent MP Jackie Lambie assuring Sky News that all politicians are guilty of it. The grass is not greener on the other side, mate, for those major parties. They're, all, they're both the same. But what is not the same is the way the media has treated such broken promises. And to remind you, let's spin back to this series of pledges by Tony Abbott on election eve in 2013. No cuts to education, no cuts to health, no change to pensions, no change to the GST and no cuts to the ABC or SBS. Tony Abbott and his Treasurer Joe Hockey broke nearly all those promises eight months later in the 2014 budget, including funding cuts to health, education and the ABC and a levy on high income earners. So, did the News Corp tabloids, who've been so vocal this time around, slam the betrayal? Surprisingly not. The Hun celebrated the coalition's backflip with tax, axe, fix. The Courier Mail gave Joe a muscle upgrade with the extreme hockey diet, while the telly praised Dr Joe's debt cure. All pretty positive stuff and not one liability headline to be seen. Funny that, but it just goes to show, when it comes to double standards, it's not just politicians who can't be trusted. But now, to the ABC, which has launched into 2024 with a hot new homegrown drama. A post on Gaza leads to turmoil at Australia's public broadcaster. ABC summer host Antoinette Latouf sacked over anti-Israel activism that enraged Ita Butros. Antoinette Latouf says she is considering legal options after losing ABC radio role. Yes, for viewers who've been holidaying on Mars, the ABC has landed itself in trouble again, with a freelance journalist suing for wrongful dismissal, 125 union staff passing a motion of no confidence in ABC Managing Director David Anderson, and accusations that the ABC buckled to a lobbying campaign from a group called Lawyers for Israel. At the centre of the row is Lebanese-Australian journalist, author and diversity advocate Antoinette Latouf, who was hired by the ABC to fill in for a week before Christmas on Sydney's morning radio show. But what do you do every year to celebrate the holidays? I want to hear about your Christmas traditions, whether they're religious ones or just quirky ones. Most of Latouf's short stint on air was spent discussing light and fluffy issues that would have upset nobody. Is Ollie the first cat to sail in the Sydney to Hobart? And on day three, she was set to sail through the week. I'm Antoinette Latouf. I'm back tomorrow. Can't wait. I'll talk to you then. But that was the last we heard from her, because two hours later, with only two shifts to go, ABC management pulled her off air. And what was her crime? She had shared an Instagram post from Human Rights Watch that claimed... The Israeli government is using starvation of civilians as a weapon of war in Gaza. Adding a line on top to say... 
Human Rights Watch reporting starvation as a tool of war. That same Human Rights Watch report had already made news on the ABC and had scored an almost identical headline on the ABC website the previous day. So, was Latouf's repost really a sackable offence? Remarkably, the ABC claims it was, although it is now saying it didn't actually sack her, just paid her out and told her not to come back. But four weeks after her dismissal, the nine papers published leaked WhatsApp messages which revealed that a group called Lawyers for Israel had been doing their damnedest to get rid of her from day one. Campaign to oust Latouf revealed in message leaks. The 150-strong lobby group had sent a barrage of letters and emails to Communications Minister Michel Rowland and copied them to senior management at the ABC. With group coordinator Nikki Stein rousing members on the day of Latouf's dismissal with a... Call to action. Please use this link to ask how Antoinette Latouf is hosting the morning ABC Sydney show. Please send a copy to ABC Ombudsman, David Anderson, Managing Director of the ABC, ABC Board. Needs to be done again today. Stein told group members she had emailed the ABC threatening legal action unless Latouf was removed, and that threat was clearly heard. Two hours before Latouf was booted, Stein texted the group to say... Just got this back from Ita Buttrose. Thank you for your email. The contents have been noted. I have forwarded your email on to Chris Oliver-Taylor, the ABC's chief content officer, who is dealing with this matter. And almost instantly, Latouf was being shown the door. Earlier that day, another lawyer for Israel, Robert Goot, who is also Deputy President of the Executive Council for Australian Jewry, had texted the group to say... I understand that she will be gone from morning radio from Friday. Due to her stance on Israel or other reasons? Israel. Should we still write? Yes, definitely. The more complaints, the better. Keep writing. Revelations of this concerted lobbying campaign and another from the 600-strong group Jewish Australian Creatives and Academics caused major ructions, as you would expect, with a mass meeting of more than 100 ABC staff passing a near-unanimous vote of no confidence in Managing Director David Anderson and the ABC's Global Affairs Editor John Lyons, who has led the broadcaster's Gaza coverage, telling colleagues that the ABC had shown pro-Israel bias and that this was one of the ABC's darkest days. When I read those WhatsApp messages, I felt embarrassed to work for the ABC. I was embarrassed that a group of 156 lawyers could laugh at how easy it was to manipulate the ABC. The following day, the ABC board held an emergency meeting and put out a statement supporting the MD, with Chair Ida Buttrose defending Anderson, saying... He has never weakly surrendered to criticism, as some critics have alleged. Adding... The assumption that either the managing director as editor-in-chief or I would be influenced by any sort of lobbying pressure is quite simply wrong. On ABC Radio last week, Patricia Carvelis asked the managing director... There is now criticism that the ABC is vulnerable to outside lobbying and political pressure, particularly from the pro-Israel lobby, is it? Oh, I reject that completely. The answer is categorically no. The facts of this case make that hard to believe, to put it mildly. So how and why did the ABC not see the trouble coming? The two had been vocal about the Israel-Gaza war for weeks, and since 7th of October, she'd made it clear where her sympathies lay, posting on Instagram... It's hard to keep working and living a normal life knowing one child is being killed in Gaza every 10 minutes by Israeli forces. On Twitter, now known as X... It's time Australian politicians and news editors stop reciting IDF talking points. There's nothing complex about this situation. These are horrific war crimes. And also on TikTok... You can and should condemn illegal military occupation of Palestine. That's been happening for 75 years. Now, Latouf is not a Hamas supporter. She has condemned them as extremists and says every civilian death is a tragedy. But her posts show more concern about the thousands of innocent women and children in Gaza killed by Israeli bombs. And she's been scathing about Israel's justification that it is acting in self-defence. Using the self-defence line on loop allows you to wash all the blood from your hands. It makes it OK to starve two million people of water, food, medicine and electricity. They deserve it. They asked for it. Let's not forget there's only one victim on one side and that's definitely not the ones dying a slow, painful death under the rubble. None of Latouf's views were hidden and managers at ABC Radio Sydney were apparently warned her social media post would be a problem given her duty as an ABC host to be impartial. And she had previously vowed not to be muzzled. 
for me as an independent and freelance journalist, nobody can fire me. If they don't want to work with me because I have voiced concerns about all of those things, then honestly, fuck them. So why did the ABC go ahead and hire her, especially if it wasn't prepared to defend her? The answer, weakness and incompetence. Incompetence for not doing its homework and for not thinking it through, and weakness for not sticking with Latouf for two more days when lawyers for Israel demanded she be sacked. As Crikey's Bernard Keane rightly puts it, The only proper way for the ABC to deal with lobbying by politicians or by self-appointed representatives of foreign governments is to direct it to the ABC's independent internal complaints handling area, now bolstered by an ABC ombudsman. Because to not do so, says Keane, is... A recipe for perceptions that the ABC is cowed and responsive to political pressure. Which is exactly where the ABC now finds itself. Because nothing Latouf put to air was a problem. The ABC insists it only dismissed Latouf because she was told not to post on social media about matters of controversy and failed to comply. But did sharing the Human Rights Watch post on Gaza really cross that line, given the ABC had covered the story and run an almost identical headline? I don't think so. As Latouf asked rhetorically on Middle East Eye... Was the post controversial, or is it controversial that an Arab woman should post that? Or is it only controversial when, we criti when Human Rights Watch criticises Israel? Because if I had shared a Human Rights Watch post that criticised Hamas on October 7 for their human rights atrocities, of which there were many, would I be fired? And I'm pretty confident I would not have been. It's hard to argue with that. Although it has to be said, the tooth could have kept off social media altogether while she was on air and might then have avoided her fate. Some will still say the ABC should never have employed her. But much of what Latouf has said in public matches views expressed by UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and world leaders outside of Jerusalem and Washington. And I believe the ABC should include such people, provided they check their advocacy at the door. What it shouldn't do is give in to organized lobbyists and shake public trust in the independence of the ABC. But that, unfortunately, is what it has done. In a postscript, one of the key complaints levelled against Latouf was that she had questioned whether pro-Palestinian demonstrators outside the Sydney Opera House in October had chanted, gas the Jews, as the Australian Jewish Association had claimed. Turns out she was right to question it. On Friday, New South Wales Police held a media conference to say a forensic expert had examined the footage and... The expert has concluded with overwhelming certainty that the phrase chanted during that protest, as recorded on the audio and visual files, was where's the Jews? Not another phrase, as otherwise widely reported. But don't expect an apology from those in the media who repeatedly made the claim. And finally, to lighter matters and cricket's big night, the Australian Cricket Awards. Mitch Marsh has won Australian cricket's most prestigious prize, the Allen Border Medal. Cricketers and their partners gathered in Melbourne overnight to celebrate a monumental year for Australian cricket. Yes, the media love a sports awards night, and it's even better when a bloke like Mitch Marsh cleans up with an acceptance speech like this. I'm a bit fat at times and I love a beer, but... Um... <laughs> and no-one loved that more than his home state daily. Bit fat and loves a beer. But our new Allen Border medalist, Mitch Marsh, couldn't have done it without WA. Mitch Marsh's win was celebrated from front to back, but he wasn't the only winner that night. Ashley Gardner has underlined her standing as one of the world's best all-rounders. After winning her second Belinda Clark Award, Gardner took more wickets than any other Australian woman across all formats last season, claiming 56 in 30 matches. And was her great achievement also featured on the front pages? Uh, no. It was Mitch Perfect on the front of the advertiser, Marsh's moment in the Oz, Former cricketer Aaron Finch with his family in the Herald Sun and the Courier Mail splash with Usman Khawaja, even though he didn't pick up any awards that night at all. Maybe if Ash Gardner wins the top cricketing gong for a third time, someone in the media will reward her with a front page splash of her own. Meantime, the woman who was making headlines this week was doing so for all the wrong reasons. With Nine News slammed for doctoring an image of Victorian MP Georgie Purcell by slicing her white dress in half giving her a crop top and appearing to enlarge her breasts. This is the original photo of the Animal Justice Party MP. These are things that would never happen to our male colleagues, ever. Channel 9 has apologised, blaming an AI Photoshop error. 
But Georgie Purcell remains unconvinced by Nyan's excuse. And it's fair to say, we are too. Because, however it happened, a real person would surely have had to look at it and given it the green light. And that's all from us for tonight. Don't forget Media Bites on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. But for now until next week, goodbye.